Hello, this is another video in the series from Strategies for Deploying Virtual Representations of the Built Environment. This time we explore floor heating using techniques that avoid the need for the level of detailed description of piping and pumps that would be required with a systems-based component approach. You could find related materials on the Strategies website. Floor heating systems differ from conventional air-based and wet central heating systems that use radiators. Firstly, they have a slow response to control signals. It may only take a few moments for an air-based system to respond to a control change. Radiators may take maybe 15 minutes to come up to temperature, and then might take a half hour to drift back to room ambient temperature when the signal turns to off. But the timings associated with floor heating are greater still. Floor heating has considerable inertia, so an off signal does not lead to a cessation of heat injections into the room. Risk of overshooting and undershooting set points need to be considered. And if mixed with uncontrolled solar gains, discomfort is certainly a risk. A large area of moderately warm temperature changes the radiant environment in the room, and thus the perception of comfort. Whilst air-based systems will initially drive a change in air temperature followed by changes in surface temperatures, radiant heating will distribute heat directly to other surfaces by way of radiant exchanges, as well as to the air adjacent to the heated surface by way of convection. Heat transfer from a warm floor involves a higher surface heat transfer coefficient. For example, an RSI at a ceiling might be in the order of 0.1, but increased to 0.17 for floor surfaces. Floor heating typically involves embedding piping within a layer of the screed below the floor surface covering. One might also use electrical resistance, but the result will be the same kinds of surface temperatures as seen in these thermographic images. Heat introduced in that layer will move by way of conduction depending on the properties of the layers within the floor structure. In this video, we will explore a thin zone approach to floor heating. We'll split the composition of the floor structure in the middle of the screed and substitute the heating element with a thin body of air. We will set a high surface heat transfer coefficient so that any heat injected into the air gets transferred into the floor structure. The thin zone approach ends up using 1D conduction, but it does so in partnership with the dynamic responses of conduction and surface heat transfer regimes available within the simulation. For early stage design decisions, it would be useful to capture these characteristics of floor heating. Is it possible to do this without specifying the detailed attributes of pipe layouts, pumps, and the like? Using a heat transfer exemplar that comes with ESP, let's see what happens. Let's open up the project manager focused on the heat transfer with mixed sensors. This is a uh, model with a dozen zones inside, exploring various kinds of heating systems, one of which is a floor heating. So if we go and look inside, there's a floor heating zone, and there's what we call a thin floor. This is a small office with furniture, fittings inside, shading on the outside. It's essentially identical to all of the other zones. But if we look at it in also with the thin floor, essentially we have a thin zone attached to the bottom of the zone where we're going to inject heat. We use a high heat transfer coefficient to ensure that that heat is transferred into the structure above the screed and heats up the floor surfaces. Uh, there's then a thermostat in the room which picks up the temperature and decides whether or not 
additional heat needs to be injected into the floor. So we get the time delay associated with floor heating between the signal saying, please inject some heat, and the heat actually arriving in the space. The floor will then warm up and the signal will eventually turn off, but there will be some inertia in the floor and it'll carry on heating. That's what we want to explore. In order to enable this kind of control, we've gone into and set convective heat transfer coefficients. If we look in here, we'll see that the thin floor has coefficients defined and its user defined the current regime sets uh, one control period lasting the whole day and for each of the surfaces related to the floor, the inside heat transfer coefficient has been set to 40. And the far side uses the default. If we go into the floor heating room, there's also a heat transfer coefficient defined. And there, the current regime involves a surface to air delta T by way of in-floor heating. There's a particular correlation that's related to that, and each of the surfaces in the zone gets a relevant set of attributes to direct the simulation to use specific kinds of heat transfer as the simulation progresses. In terms of how are we controlling this, We'll go and look in the zone controls. And so here are my different controls, and here's one set up for floor heating. It has three periods on weekdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, uh, a single period on Sunday and holidays. So if we open up that control, basically we've got an ideal multi-sensor control, and a multi-sensor controller allows us to actuate in one zone based on what is sensed in another zone. And so we're sensing the conditions in the room and we're doing the actuation within the thin floor zone. And we've got a heat capacity of two kilowatts in that thin floor zone and a heating set point of 35 degrees within that thin zone. We set the cooling so it never comes on. The What we're sensing in the room is a mix of dry bulb temperature, 60%, and the balance in mean radiant temperature. And what we want to do is maintain the room between, uh, at early in the morning, between 15 and 26 degrees. Later, after six o'clock, we want to maintain the room between 20 and 24 degrees. And then in the evening, we go back to the set point. We allow the heating in the thin zone to get up to 35 degrees. That sets the uh, working temperature of, quote, the fluid. So this is a low temperature heating system. Let's run a simulation. We have a number of simulation presets already done. Let's go ahead and see how this behaves with a winter simulation. So it will run for 20 days to get the temperature normalized. It will then run at eight time steps per hour, save full energy balance at the zones and the surfaces, and it will dump out one file for the building results and another one for the mass flow results. An integrated simulation. At the moment, let's go ahead and ask for an interactive. And the simulation engine starts up. It's past the name of the model configuration file, which then loads in, initiate the simulation. I'll take the suggested name. Let's monitor the progress in the floor heating room, as well as the thin floor. And just for comparison, let's look at the temperature where we've just got a base case convective heating going on in a office. Let's plot the temperature because we've got the floor might get up to 35 degrees. Let's do it between 0 and 40 degrees. 
and commence the simulation, focusing on the floor. Okay, now we've passed the free simulation time. We can see the heating coming on in the floor zone, and we can see the temperature in the two other zones. Now, one which has a very quick response, well, that's the air-based system. The one which is lagging, well, that's the floor heating system. So, we'll click quit the simulation engine and go into results analysis. And it will be in the temp folder. Let's focus on floor heat and temperatures, dry bulb temperature and surface inside surface temperatures of the floor, the ceiling, and partition. So the partition and the ceiling are relatively the same temperature. Um, the floor is several degrees warmer, but the dry bulb temperature is getting actually quite cold. So essentially we've looked at more than a week here. Um, let's focus down so we can see some of the patterns a little bit in greater detail. So here we're just focused on the 9th through the 11th. There's the temperature, 8 o'clock in the morning. The temperature starts ramping up. Um, it might be about 7 or something like that that we see the floor temperature come up. The heat goes up to 24 degrees because we've overshot what was asked for. And then it gradually drifts down to around 15 degrees, which was the night set point. We then have a brief warm up. The floor is attempting to be at 20 degrees and then going up to 24 degrees. So in order to maintain the temperature overnight, the floor is still somewhat active and then the temperature ramps up during the next day to get us to our 20 degrees. So that's a graphical look at things. What other kinds of things might we look at. So if we go into inquire about what kind of energy is delivered, we want to go and select the thin floor because that's where uh, the heat is being injected. Over those uh, 9th, 10th, and 11th, we've got 22.38 kilowatt hours into the thin floor, which is equivalent to 1.66 kilowatt hours per square meter. It's needed for 27 hours. If we look at the zone energy balance. Well, let's select the floor heat zone. Integrated over time, gains and losses. So over those days, essentially our major losses are infiltration. There's a little bit of air movement uh, with other zones. We've got some occupants, lights, and small power. We've got convection from opaque surfaces. That's our heat gain from the floor, effectively. We've got a little bit of uh, opaque surface loss to the outside, and transparent loss to the outside is approximately the same uh, scale as infiltration. And there's our energy balance. I would say that a low temperature floor heating system is not doing terribly well for that time of year and with temperatures of say minus 12 degrees outside. Therefore, uh, we could consider two possible options. One is to shift the start of the heating period earlier. Maybe it needs to be five o'clock in the morning in order to, to get us a decent ramp up in temperatures. Maybe we need to go to 40 degrees uh, for the working fluid. Both of those would simply require small changes in the control law to enable, and then we could go and explore that. But the result would then be um, knowledge about 
what kind of working temperature might actually be appropriate, what kinds of time delays are we noticing in the model.